Good afternoon and welcome back to North Star Oasis. I'm your host Jeff Williams. We're here on Saturday, August 8th for yet another fun-filled, I hope to be fun-filled edition of North Star Oasis. And I uh, just want to start off the show just by reminding you that we are on Facebook, we are on Twitter, we are on YouTube. All of our episodes dating back to November of last year are archived on YouTube, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis. And we are going to start, believe it or not, I'm going to start a little bit different, differently today because there's only 138 shopping days left until Christmas. And I got a message from a friend of mine in Rochester, Minnesota today. I'm going to read her uh, Facebook uh, message um, have you heard the news yet? I just got a message that our favorite Santa's contract was not renewed. This is disappointing. One year, my daughter and I scrambled to Apache Mall to get a photo with Santa and so she could tell him what she wanted for Christmas that year. We had just missed him and they were closing down. We walked around and he was nowhere to be found. As we were turning around, he walked up to his chair and saw us. We knew they were closed and I didn't want to intrude on his time. He smiled, and as if the magic of Christmas truly lived in him, he waved her over. Her face lit up, and she ran up to him. He scooped her up, and they chatted, and we got a pic with him. I remember walking away thinking of how kind he genuinely was and how dedicated he was to making others happy. What a gift he gave to us. A friend messaged me to tell me what was happening with the non-renewal of his contract, which is disappointing. However, sometimes things can happen, so better things can happen. Let's all show our love to our favorite Santa, be an elf, and share his page, your own personal story, and go see him when he's back. Details to follow of his location, how you can send a message to corporate America. You can take Santa out of the mall, but you cannot take our Santa away from us. Ho, ho, ho. And if you, if you can, um, there is a Facebook page. If we can put this on the computer screen real quick. Rochester, Minnesota's only Santa. And he's listed as a government official. So uh, th here's how you can help Santa. We are so excited to launch this GoFundMe campaign. Share with all your friends and keep the Christmas spirit alive and thriving in Rochester, Minnesota. And I know that Rochester, Minnesota does not, is not in our coverage area. And I also know that in the Twin Cities we have a lot of malls and so it's like Santa's up here seem to be a dime a dozen but for Rochester Minnesota they might need our help a little bit so just want to encourage you to go to Rochester Minnesota's only Santa page he is a government official and uh, like that page <laughs> I know uh, when I mentioned he's a government official uh, everyone in the control room is just cracking up but it, that's what it says government official Santa is a government official and now government is taking over Christmas. Well, we got 138 days left. Anyhow, moving on into government action. The next presidential election will be held, uh, excuse me, the presidential inauguration will be held in 76 weeks. 76 weeks, President Obama will be retiring. And that means we have a whole slate of candidates that we've been going through. I am not going to be discussing the Republican uh, presidential primary debate that occurred the other day for the simple reason that I haven't even had time to watch it. I mean, there were two debates. Uh, from all I've heard about the debate was that Carly Fiorina did really good in the early debate and that Donald Trump was targeted for the late debate and then I did hear Ben Carson's closing statement that was my entire out of what four hours of debate that was my limited knowledge of what actually happened so perhaps this week I'll have time to catch a rebroadcast but we'll probably discuss more about the debate in um, you know sometime next month after the second debate uh, for the simple reason that one, I hope to be able to watch that, and then two, the first debate is is almost non-essential. I mean, I remember the last time we had a Republican presidential primary debate, and we had Michelle Bachman and Tim Pawlenty, both from Minnesota, and both were going at each other, 
and yet neither of them lasted past Iowa. As a matter of fact, it was the Iowa straw poll, which should technically have been held this very weekend until the uh, Iowa Republican Party canceled the event. Uh, they ended up... Um, Plenty pulled out after the Iowa straw poll four years ago. Bachman made it through the Iowa caucuses and pulled out shortly after. And that was the highlights that I remember from the very first primary debate. The Democrat debate, I understand, is going to be held sometime in October, at least their first debate. So I figure by next month we'll start getting more into the debate discussion. Uh, in August, we're probably a little bit too far out yet. But we still also have candidates to go through, and we're finally getting near the end of the list, and just when I thought we were kind of hitting the bottom, then a whole other crop of candidates came in and announced. But we are starting to make, make, it, make our way through. We uh, highlight one presidential candidate every week. We give them their time. Um, and this is what we call the Presidential Flavor of the Week. And today's Presidential Flavor of the Week is Jeb Bush. We're going to show you a behind-the-scenes video first. I like behind-the-scenes video. Excited. This is the run through of uh, this afternoon, what will be uh, the launch of a campaign for president. Mama! So proud of you. The best news of the day was my mom finally told me that I was her favorite. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. You mean of all the children? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. I feel great. This is a fabulous day for our family. I wouldn't have done it anyplace else. Miami is my home. It's where Kaluma and I raised our family. It's where I started a business. It's what the future looks like in our country. It's dynamic, alive, full of energy. It's a beautiful place, and I was happy to launch my campaign here. Campaigns aren't easy. And they're not supposed to be. And not one of us deserves the job by right of resume, party, seniority, family, or family narrative. It's nobody's turn. It's everybody's test. And it's wide open, exactly as a contest for president should be. In any language, my message will be an optimistic one. I will take nothing and no one for granted. I will run with heart and I will run to win. And that was the behind the scenes video of uh, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush uh, when he was doing his uh, presidential announcement um, in June. And we're actually going to show you some clips right now of uh, Governor Bush's speech. The party now in the White House is planning a no suspense primary for a no change election to hold on to power, to slog on with the same agenda under another name. That's our opponent's call to action this time around. That's all they've got left. The presidency should not be passed on from one liberal to the next. The question for me is, what am I going to do about it? And I've decided I'm a candidate for president of the United States of America. We will take Washington, the static capital of this dynamic country, then turn it out of the business of causing problems, and we'll get it back on the, on the right side of free enterprise and freedom for all Americans. I know we can fix this, because I've done it. Our president and his foreign policy team have been so eager to be the history makers that they failed to be the peacemakers. Oh, yeah. 
With their phone it in foreign policy, the Obama, Clinton, Kerry team is leaving a le legacy of crises uncontained, violence unopposed, enemies unnamed, friends undefended, and alliances unraveling. Every school should have high standards, and the federal government should have nothing to do with setting them. Nationwide, if I'm president, we will take the power of choice away from the unions and bureaucrats and give it back to parents. Uh, according to Governor Bush, every school should have high standards, but the federal government should have nothing to do with setting them. But yet his brother was the president, and he's the one who set federal standards through No Child Left Behind. Um, I don't know. Passed on from one liberal to the next. The president should, should not be passed on from one liberal to the next. But on the other hand, he says, it's nobody's turn, everybody's test. It should not be based upon your family. His father was the president, his brother was the president. We had four years of his father, then we had eight years of Bill Clinton, then we had eight years of his brother, then we had four years of the current occupant, and out of 24 years, we have had 20 years between two families. So essentially 24 years of running this country between three families in a land of 318 million people. And I think that's probably my biggest critique of Governor Bush is the fact that he's a Bush. Now, even if he were to get elected as president and serve his four or eight years, he will be different than his father, he will be different than his brother because he's his own man. But at the same time, he has a lot of influence from both his father and his brother. And that's one of the key reasons he's been able to come out so strong in fundraising. I mean, Jeb Bush in the last, uh, uh, the last financial reporting period, I think he had something like $109 million between his campaign and the super PAC. And you know darn well that all of this money is from the context from his father and his brother. And yet both of the previous Bushes in this country they left the, they left, well, one was defeated after only four years, and the other one had extremely low poll numbers when he left. What's to say that the current, the current candidate named Bush is going to do the same? So if you want to support Bush, well, hey, go, go for it. I'm not going to tell you who to support, but I'm going to tell you I do not support a Bush or a Clinton. I think it's time that we see somebody new. But I am going to give Jeb Bush his due, and I am going to run one of his campaign ads titled 1977. And that was a very short ad by Governor Jeb Bush. Uh, on, no, I won't even support Chelsea Clinton for office. I will not support Hillary Clinton for office. Uh, I think this country is t ready to move on from both the Clintons and the Bushes. And again, that's just one person's analysis. Uh, Jeb Bush did a lot of good when he was governor of Florida. But on the other hand, when I see what happened in the White House and the state of this country with both his father and his brother, I think a lot of people will probably agree that it's time to move on from the Clintons. But right now, it's actually time to move on in this show. Uh, don't want to beat that horse any further dead than it is. But speaking of death, I guess today's kind of a death show uh, when I look at what we have. Uh, and I never heard of this thing until about a week or so ago, but Hitchbot is dead. Hitchbot is a... Better what was that? Hitchbot is a, uh, is a um, robot that was created by China, uh, some Canadian scientists. They wanted to uh, send this thing on a pretty much around the world trip. And the only way he was going to get to his destination is by the goodness of people who would pick him up and take him to the next place. 
and he passed away recently. He was brutally murdered, robot, killed in Philadelphia. Here's the story. In the quest to better understand how man and machine can relate, an intriguing social experiment sent a robot on the road. The hope was that Hitchbot would make its way across the country with some human help. That is until the plan hit a snag. Here's NBC's Rahima Ellis. Hello? Unlike other robots designed to help people, Whoa, he talked again to me. Hitchbot's mission was to see how many people would help it. Please pick me up and put me in your vehicle. In a huge test of human kindness. I am Hitchbot, a hitchhiking robot. This immobile kid-sized robot counted on strangers to get around. It's like walking around with a celebrity. I think the opportunity, you know, for people to actually engage unsupervised, you know, with, with this kind of technology was really part of the charm of it. Beginning in Canada, where it was created, Hitchbot spent 26 days hitchhiking across that vast country, then 18 days in the Netherlands, 10 days in Germany, and even grabbed a cold beer. I can make a cameo appearance in a film when we get to California. Two weeks ago, Hitchbot set out to hitchhike across America, first starting in Boston, with hopes strangers would then take it to Times Square, Mount Rushmore, and the Grand Canyon. Hitchbot did pretty well until arriving in Philadelphia, where it got no love from someone in the city of brotherly love. After only two weeks in the U.S., the journey ended. Of nearly 46,000 followers, one tweeted, I'm sorry your trip was cut short in Philly. Another poor, innocent Hitchbot. And I didn't expect to happen, that there were so many people happy to root for Hitchbot, to talk about it, um, to think what it likes, you know, um, that's wonderful. Today, the grand social experiment has ended, but in it perhaps a lesson for all of us. Hitchbot's final message, my trip must come to an end for now, but my love for humans will never fade. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, New York. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and then click on Well, that was the death of Hitchbot. But actually, we have some pretty exclusive video for you. We are going to show you the last known video of Hitchbot. This was taken the night before he was brutally murdered in Philadelphia. Essentially, it's how he got to where he was when, whenever the, uh, before the, before the murderer got to him. And yeah, I hate calling him, you know, he's a robot. Why am I calling him a murderer? But I have no other, no other term for it. So let's uh, show the last known video of Hitchbot. What's going on? So explain to me what's going on. This robot's been hitchhiking. This robot made it all the way across Canada in 26 days, right? Then they took it to Germany, did the same thing there, did the same thing in the Netherlands. So they decided for this summer to get it across America. So it started out in Massachusetts. It's been to like uh, Fenway. It's been on like a fishing boat. It's been to Times Square. So, so and you had nothing to do with this robot. You just picked it up from it. somebody. My only, uh, my only thing with it was like. Um, yeah, like this robot needs a ride. Can you get it to its next destination? I end up with a robot right now. Can you just show me what it does, though? Does it do anything? Uh, well, I mean, if it oh, sees like a car right, is coming nearby, it, 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 it like moves its uh, moves its like thumb, as in like it's trying oh, to. Are you, are, are you? This very nice family is out here having a picnic at 1:40 a.m. <laughs> with the kids. And made me uh, a traditional, will we'll fix me a traditional Cambodian dish. Yes. And it's spicy as hell. My mouth is on fire. My nose is probably running. That's my chicken. Woo! But it's good. So thank you guys so much. You're in the block. Say what up. What up? Woo! In my kitchen. All right, peeps. I'm taking the hitch bot. I think Ed and I are going to take it over to Independence Mall and get a picture with it with the Liberty Bell. And then tomorrow. I'm going to tweet out where I'm at or something and I'm going to see one of you guys want to take it to DC. That's where it wants to go next. So, if I die, these are the guys that killed me, okay? These are the guys that gave it to me if I die, okay? I'm taking it. Cool concept. I guess this, this robot, like you heard, has been trying to hitchhike across America. It already did it in Canada and Europe and somehow it came to me and I'm part of this journey for this crazy robot. So it's kind of neat. And uh, let's go, robot. You're coming with me, buddy. Ed wanted to put it in the trunk. In the bed. It's like, I don't know where that thing's been. I guess, does it have to wear a seatbelt? 
question. They could be listening to us. I know they're probably listening to us. us Hitchbot, do do you need a seatbelt? Yes. Oh my God! What the hell did you hear that? What? It just said I need a seatbelt. Put it in the back, please. <laughs> See, it back. it's freaked it's out. Back. It's gonna make me crash. No, it's not. You're fine. Do you want to ride in the back? Cool. Oh hey, we're around Philadelphia. Are you know that? Hey. Do you, would you mind riding in the back, please? Please sit in the back. <laughs> Why? So you can insult me again. What the heck? It's staying here. It's so creepy. It's been talking to us. I don't know. I can't believe we picked talking up. Is my new I, had to, name. I had to pull over Philadelphia. because I can't drive with this going on. I can't do it. I can't, I can't believe that. I, we just picked up a hitchhiking robot. This yeah. is so weird. I think yeah. we got we to gotta take this robot over to see the Liberty Bell. Let's do it. Let's do Let's it. Do We're it. gonna go take a seat. Stay there. tuned. What I learned with this robot is, like, I don't have time to take it to Washington D.C. right now. So I brought it here to the oldest street in Philadelphia, which I thought was cool. So listen, you're on your own, buddy. You're gonna have to hitch a ride. It says that on the instructions on the back that you stick it on the side of the road, and someone picks it up. And I guess that's the that's the whole plan for this thing. That's what makes it unique. So I want to see someone actually come and pick it up that has no idea about what it is, and then they have to learn. Hey buddy, it was good to see you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Good to see you. Alright, we're gonna get you a ride right now. Hey man. How much would it cost to take this to the DC? Can I do it? For the right price? Take that to DC? Yeah. Are you serious? It's a robot. Well, we, we're serious that we want to know how much it would be if it's in our price range. We want to do it. How much you got this one? How much would it cost? Do you want to go to DC? Three hundred and fifty dollars for a round trip to fucking DC. Three hundred and fifty dollars to DC, dude. Is that bad or good? That's freaking great. Oh, you, I don't know, you, dude. I, round trip to New York City. Yeah, but do you think like, he, he thinks we're lying? Do you think he'd actually drive it to DC? That's the thing. You know he would. He would have threw your ass into the river yeah, and right. took three hundred fifty dollars. I think we just gotta leave him. Kind of, I'm kind of waiting for Ali Sheedy to come come into the uh, screen playing the old uh, character Stephanie Speck from the old film Short Circuit that came out uh, 29 years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we remember, number five is alive was one of the big lines from that, you know, along with do not disassemble, do not disassemble, no disassemble, and that was number five. And if we can bring my computer up, uh, just a, a little bit of nostalgia. And there is number five from Short Circuit. And 29 years later, his cousin or nephew was disassembled in Philadelphia. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens now in the long term with whether or not... Um, whether or not Hitchbot gets fixed and continued on his way, but it was an interesting story. But I think it goes to show a little bit deeper here. If we just, you know, the cuteness of a robot and all. Let's take one step deeper. And that also shows humanity. This is a robot that could go across Canada in, what, 26 days? Unmolested. This is a robot that could go and have a beer in Germany. 70 years ago, we were at war with Germany. But now, we have this robot hitchhiking its way across the pond over to Germany and being, you know, filmed having a beer. Not that it actually drank it, but it held, you know, held the, the mug. But yet, we get back in the United States and the thing can't even make its way across our country without being disassembled. And I think that kind of shows where our country is going that we're not the way we used to be and perhaps we need to get back to the way we were and not the way we are currently and yeah what was this thing doing in the city of brotherly love i had a friend of mine who lives in philadelphia who said oh i mean i wouldn't have that thing around without having at least a nine millimeter or a glock because that's just the way philadelphia is but when we look at our country i think we should expect a little bit better than that. We're going to take you back, again, not so good time in history, and I'm saying history, not just our history, but the end of World War II. Last week, we had um, 70th anniversary 
of a very important event that changed the world. And that was oh. the Hiroshima, Japan atomic bombing. August the 6th, 1945, two American Super Fortress bombers arrived over the Japanese city of Hiroshima on the world's most devastating military mission. The Enola Gay, with Colonel Paul Tibbetts at the controls, was about to drop the first atomic bomb, a weapon conceived by a group of international scientists based at Los Alamos in the United States. So far, no one knew exactly what effect the bomb would have, either on the unsuspecting inhabitants below or on the crew of the plane itself. They were soon to find out. As soon as the bomb went off, the whole inside of the airplane just lit up as if someone had set off a flashbulb. And then we had to wait, and this was our big worry, is what would the blast do when the blast got to the airplane? And finally the blast did arrive. It was like being in an ash can and getting someone kicking. And then we uh, crowded to the window and uh, saw uh, this, just the whole city completely covered in smoke with this very tall mushroom cloud rising from it. President Truman had already threatened the Japanese with a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. When the truth was revealed, his words seemed an understatement. Buildings vaporized, so did the clothes on people's backs. Was it a bomb that should never have been dropped? Some people thought so. Others argued that it shortened the war and kept the subsequent peace. One thing was not in doubt. Hiroshima taught mankind the awful truth about nuclear weapons and just what horror they could bestow. Now, what did... President Truman say, I know the video you just saw said, well, pre and President Truman said, and then it all went, went quiet. It went, you know, went back to uh, silence. Well, here is what President Truman said after the atomic bomb went off at Hiroshima. <laughs> It was on his way back from Europe that President Truman announced to an astonished world that an entirely new force had now come under Anglo-American control. It is an atomic bomb. It is a harnessing of the basic power of the universe. The force from which the sun draws its power has been loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. For obvious reasons of physical security, production had been affected in the States. Two of the three factories were at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Work had gone on secretly for two years at this place under the direction of British and American scientists. When the news of their success burst on the world, the shock was as violent as the bomb itself, and the potentialities even more shattering. Thousands were employed in the factories without knowing what they were making. A diagram illustrates the uranium atom the electrons circling the nucleus, the sitting of the atom, and the release of stupendous energy. It's not the knowledge of this colossal force that is new, but the power to control it. And that raises the biggest query as to the world's future. Hiroshima got one small atomic bomb, and 60% of it was wiped out. The bursting of the experimental bomb in New Mexico was filmed. Here it comes. The camera was six miles away when that picture was taken, so the sound was delayed, of course. Smoke clouds rose to 40,000 feet. Will this power, now available to man, bring another, even more suicidal war upon us? Or can it be made to rule out war and open a new progressive chapter of history, the Atomic Age? And that ushered in the Atomic Age 70 years ago this past week. Uh, but now, what has happened in the uh, last 70 years? Um, 
Qu a question that just came out to me, are the daisy cutter bombs more powerful than this bomb? And I actually don't have that, uh, that answer as of right now, but I will uh, look it up as quick as I'm able. But in the meantime, we had, um, what did the Japanese do to mark the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima? Let's take a look. It was 70 years ago today that a man-made firestorm was unleashed on Hiroshima, Japan. 140,000 were killed. But the atomic bomb did spare U.S. forces the invasion of Japan by forcing the empire to surrender. A peace bell was rung to mark the anniversary. Thousands attended. Lanterns floated in memory of the victims. Seth Doan is in Hiroshima. The scars of 70 years ago have been paved over in the rebuilding of this bustling modern city. But the pain is still there. I am standing on the victims always, I feel. So many people died here. Yes. Keiko Ogura was eight years old when America dropped its atomic bomb a mile and a half from her home. We must be attacked by 100 bombs, we thought. It was just one designed to stop World War II and force Japanese surrender. The intense heat from the explosion incinerated the center of the city and the wooden buildings in it. This was the only building left standing in this part of town, and it remains today as a stark reminder of the devastation. At the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, director Kenji Shiga showed us everyday items that became artifacts. This is one of the things people want to come and see. A four-year-old boy was killed while riding this tricycle. It's grim evidence of the nuclear explosion. Temperatures reached 7,000 degrees. Shiga told us these personal belongings, including an incinerated school lunchbox burned by heat waves, conveys how lethal and powerful the bomb was. Today, there are 16,000 nuclear weapons on Earth, he said, so it's important to take another look at what happened here. It's difficult to tell the story, but you feel it's a story that must be told. Uh -huh. Must be told, because uh, nuclear weapon will kill the future generations. This city straddles a desire to move forward and to never forget. Seth Doan, CBS News, Hiroshima, Japan. Now, I actually do have the answer on the uh, Hiroshima bomb versus the daisy cutter. And I want to get that out of the way before I really give you my comments here. Uh, the BLU-82, or daisy cutter, is the largest conventional bomb in existence. It's 17 feet long, 5 feet in diameter, about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, but much heavier. It contains 12,600 pounds of GX slurry, ammonium nitrate, aluminum powder, and polystyrene. And is so bulky they cannot even be launched in a conventional method. To put that in context, the ammonium nitrate in just one daisy cutter bomb is about six times the amount that was used in the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Although the blast from this bomb is extremely lethal, it still has less than a thousandth the destructive power of the atomic bomb used on Hiroshima. So that is the answer to the daisy cutter versus Hiroshima bomb question. But what I really wanted to mention here was... We take a look, and I actually, for many, many years, believe that we launched the bomb on Hiroshima because it was going to end the war and that we wouldn't have to do a mainland invasion. It wasn't until I actually had to study this back in 2011 that I found out that that was an untruth. I don't want to say a lie, but there was a little bit of deception there because what it was really done was... Um, it was to kind of begin a new war with the then Soviet Union. Uh, at, that, at that point in time, as documents have now you know, come out in recent years, have shown that the Japanese were actually pretty much ready to surrender. There was an envoy that had made its way through the Swedish delegation that had pretty much specified as much. Truman had known that he didn't have to use the atomic bomb, but still he made that choice. And he, after, after a couple of years later, he was on the USS Williamsburg uh, 
presidential yacht on the Potomac River, kind of thinking, did he make the right choice? He was second-guessing himself afterwards. And that actually came down to one of the reasons why General Douglas MacArthur was sacked. Because MacArthur said, we've got the A-bomb, let's go and use it. And having been responsible for ordering the destruction of uh, about 140,000 people, you know, the first time, Truman didn't want to go down that route. And that was a, a big part of the conflict with the Korean War. But with the Hiroshima bomb, it was uh, General Leslie Graves who was a big spearhead behind using the bomb. And the Russians at that time, the Soviets, they were, the war in the, uh, in the European theater was pretty much over by that time. And there was pressure put on the Soviet Union to assist in the campaign against Japan. But it was more of a, we want you to assist, but we really don't want you to. And as a result, there, you know, in Russia, they also, the Soviet Union already had, had the bomb. We didn't know it at the time. Uh, there was some bluffing between Truman and Joseph Stalin that was going on. Again, this is all stuff that, in, in light of historical releases of documents, had already you know, had been released, not since you know, 1945, right away. We didn't know this stuff until recent years. But then we go back to where the Russians were. They took Korea. They took the Korean Peninsula. And we fought a war there in 1950 to 53. You know, and that was from Russian interference, Soviet interference in the Korean Peninsula. The Soviets were planning a raid on mainland Japan and Hokkaido. Japan could have easily been split just like Korea was between a Rus uh, Soviet and American sections, a communist uh, Japan and an American Japan. That's where we were at that time. When Truman made that decision, I firmly believe in the light of the historical evidence that I have, I have viewed, that he did that as a shot across the bow against the Soviet Union. The war could have ended even without a mainland invasion. The war could have ended uh, just by accepting through backdoor channels the surrender. As a matter of fact, the surrender that occurred on the USS Missouri teakwood decks was identical to the one that was brought through the Swedish delegation. We did not need to use the atomic bomb to end World War II. But what it did do was it ushered in a new era of the Cold War that we had two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, and it became a worldwide game of chess. And I hate saying, uh, you know, a game of chess because obviously people's lives were at stake. It was not a game. But if you look at involvement in Korea, if you look at involvement in Vietnam, you look at the split of uh, Germany, building of the Berlin Wall, all of this happened because we had two superpowers that were jockeying for position for world dominance. Both sides were afraid of each other. The Soviets wanted, uh, they wanted a buffer zone. They didn't want Western invasion. But at the same time, every time the Soviets would do something, the Americans would do something. Every time the Americans would do something, the Soviets would do something. And that is what led to the Cold War. But it started August 6, 1945, with the bombing of Hiroshima. World War II was essentially, was essentially over. The surrender occurred a couple of weeks later. Yes, it took one more bomb at Nagasaki in order to really get the Japanese government to realize that the Americans were serious. We didn't do the back-channel diplomatic negotiations. We took them head on. But that's what August 6, 1945 represented. The ushering in of the Cold War. Now we're going to move to one other thing that happened on that same day. And that was, well, I'll just show you the, uh, the first video clip. He may be the only person in history who fell in love with flight because President Calvin Coolidge took a vacation. A baby-faced Swede who flew a trainer in a loop around the center span of the Golden Gate Bridge. He was a stunningly talented pilot.
It was said of them that he thought more quickly in three dimensions than most people did in two. His string of combat victories over New Guinea turned him into a national hero. He shot down an incredible 40 enemy aircraft before being removed from combat once and for all. A national treasure who could no longer be risked on the battlefield. When the endless cycle of parades and war bond rallies wore him down, he asked for and received assignment as a test pilot in the secret program that produced America's first combat jet. He is Richard Ira Bong, and he is a legend of air power. Well, that was the beginning of another TV show, but I just wanted to show you the, the beginning with Richard Ira Bong. He was known as the Ace of Aces in World War II, American Ace of Aces. He shot down 40 Japanese aircraft during the war in his P-38 Lightning. Uh, he was from Poplar, Wisconsin, about 13 miles, I believe, 13 miles uh, east of Superior, Wisconsin. So he's in our neck of the woods. Um, if you look at, and I've got the stats here, um, Germany's Eric Hartmann was the top ace of all time with 352 aerial victories. That's a lot of shoot downs. He's still the top ace of all time. Um, there's a lot of them, mainly Japanese fly, uh, ma mainly German flyers, some Japanese flyers. Remember, the Japanese were at war in China for uh, years before the American involvement uh, that started on December 7th, 1941. Uh, but of American flyers, Major Richard Ira Bong from Poplar, Wisconsin, was the top ace. Major Thomas McGuire, who McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey, is named after, he uh, ranked second with 38 kills. Uh, McGuire was shot down on January 7, 1945, in a mission over the Central Philippines. Uh, he was, you know, an aggressive uh, pilot who couldn't stand the fact that Bong was still a couple of of uh, kills ahead of him, and he was killed while trying to surpass Bong's record. Uh, Navy Captain David McCampbell. He ranks third with 34 kills, the only other American World War II flyer to achieve more than 30 aerial victories. And we're going to take a quick look now at, uh, okay, yeah, uh, our, my producer says 352 is like, you know, one day for a year. That's a lot of missions to fly and stay sane, and he's absolutely right. Um, and of course, with Hartman, that occurred over a period of a number of years. But now, Bong was in a P-38. P-38 was a, pro a propeller-driven aircraft. And he had eventually... Well, let's show the other video just be before we get there. Major Richard Bong of Poplar, Wisconsin, who became the leading American ace with 40 combat victories. Just out of college, Dick Bong entered cadet training in 1941 and became a pilot and a second lieutenant early in 1942. Among the first fighter pilots to arrive in Darwin, Australia in August 1942 was Lieutenant Bong, a member of the 49th Fighter Group flying P-38. It didn't take long for him to become known in the air over the southwestern Pacific. Soon after arriving, Bong had eight victories to his credit and he had become leader of the 9th Fighter Squadron. As the combined American forces slowly pushed the enemy back toward the Philippines, Bong flew cover for light and heavy bombers, taking on enemy aircraft wherever he found them. With 28 confirmed combat victories, Dick Bong returned to the United States for advanced gunnery training in April 1944. Soon he was back in Australia as a gunnery instructor for 5th Air Force fighter pilots. By this time, the battle for Leyte was going on, and even while the naval fighting continued, work was rushed to put its airstrips back into shape to receive fighter planes. Enemy aircraft, 
based on the west coast of Leyte, raided day and night. Dick Bong was there, flying missions every day and winning more victories. The Japanese stronghold was at Ormac Bay. Twelve times they sent convoys to reinforce their garrison there, and twelve times the 5th Air Force turned them back. The last Japanese convoy to be hit was in December of 1944. By now, Dick Baum had 38 combat victories. On the afternoon of December 12, 1944, in front of a guard of honor consisting of 12 pilots, each of whom had 12 or more air combat victories, General Douglas MacArthur pinned the coveted Medal of Honor on Major Richard Baum. The citation read in part as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action, above and beyond the call of duty, in the Southwest Pacific area, from 10 October to 15 November, 1944. Though assigned to duty as gunnery instructor and neither required nor expected to perform combat duty, Major Bong voluntarily and at his own request engaged in repeated combat missions, including unusually hazardous sorties over Balapapan, Borneo, and in the Leyte area of the Philippines. During the week that followed, Major Bong won two more victories over the enemy. They were numbers 39 and 40. After more than two years and hundreds of missions, Major Bong returned to the United States in January of 1945. Major Richard Bong, representative of the highest type of young Americans who served their country. Now, quick little side story about when Major Bong received the Medal of Honor. Uh, General MacArthur had this, he had prepared remarks as most generals do. You know, he had it all written out. He knew what he was going to say. But then when it came time to actually present the medal, uh, he just put his prepared remarks away and he just said, Major Richard Ira Bong, who has ruled the air from New Guinea to the Philippines, I now induct you into the Society of the Bravest of Brave, the wearers of the Congressional Medal of Honor of the United States. And that was it. Do you know what Major Bong did after he received the medal? He went back to the hooch and he had a beer, put the medal aside, had a beer, sat down with his buds, they pat him on the shoulder and congratulated him. And then, you know, after that, he, you know, just, you know, this is December of 44, so after that, he went out flying again. Uh, for him, the medal wasn't anything of significance. Uh, but the reason I bring up Bong on this week is because, uh, and keep in mind, he was 24 years old. So he would be 94 right now. Uh, but as the world was learning about the atomic bomb in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, for one 24-year-old fighter pilot in California, Richard Ira Bong, it was business as usual. He just had another test flight to make. He had converted by this time into the P-80 uh, shooting star. It was the first jet aircraft that we had in this country. And... Around 5 p.m., uh, the experienced pilot taxied that P-80 shooting star to the runway at Lockheed Air Terminal, as it was called then. Uh, it's currently the Bob Hope Airport in Burbank, California, and it turned out to be a very short flight. Uh, Army Sergeant Robert Lampy was stationed at Camp Roberts. Uh, it's a few hours' drive north of Los Angeles. And he was hitchhiking through the area en route to the Birmingham General Hospital near Van Nuys, California, when he had witnessed the P-80 takeoff. It was, and the reason he went to the Birmingham General Hospital was because he had one of his buddies from the Battle of Okinawa who was in the hospital there. But Lampy had witnessed the P-80 takeoff 
and he admitted it was only the second time that he had seen a jet aircraft. Uh, according to Lampy, he said the plane flew practically over the top of me, very low to the south and banking east in a big loop and back to the terminal. As I headed west, I could hear the jet, com the jet coming back toward me from the north, having finished a big loop. The sound of the engine made me sense that something was wrong, and as I looked up at the very low-flying plane, I could see the pilot trying to pull back the canopy. It seemed he was struggling to keep the craft airborne against a tremendous pull that was bringing the plane to earth on the wing and the nose. The pilot managed to bail out but was too low for the parachute to deploy properly. The impact of the crash caused the plane to bounce at least 50 feet into the air before it exploded with the wreckage landing uh, into a field near a residential area at Oxnard Street and Satsuma Avenue in North Hollywood in the location where the Golden State Convalescent Hospital is today, less than three miles from where the aircraft took off. Uh, I'm going to tell you quickly here about another person who recalled the incident. Uh, Frederick Logan, he was only four years old at the time of the crash. Uh, and he, he lived two blocks away from the family's home at Denny Avenue. I heard a plane and looked up to see a jet plane fly, I looked up, I heard a plane and looked up to see a jet plane flying over trailing black smoke. I said to myself that plane crash is, that plane is going to crash, said Logan. The plane was the P-80 piloted by Bong. It crashed into a field two blocks from my house. And as uh, being a four-year-old, he said, I remember the time, uh, I remember at the time people saying it was Major Bong, but I thought they were saying Major Bomb who was killed. I do not remember anything about the other major headline, Hiroshima. I don't know the story of, I didn't know the Richard, story of Richard Bong's fame until years later, said Logan, who serves as a docent at the P-38 Museum in Riverside, California. So Major Richard Ira Bong, died in a plane crash 70 years ago this past week. And as I finish up this, it was his 13th flight in the P-80. Uh, flew four hours and 15 minutes. And I actually had one other thing, but it just seemed that there was, the oil pressure had gone out and the, and the backup was not turned on. So I'm going to leave with this. If you ever get a chance to get up to Superior, Wisconsin, check out the Richard Ira Bong Military Heritage Center. It's a great experience and a great place to go. And that's all based upon his original artifacts. But right now, we have a phone call. We're going to go to our line for our phone caller. Jeff Williams. Yes. Jeff Williams. Yes, excellent show. Thanks for having a new show every week. This Hiroshima stuff is fascinating. I never knew that before. I never knew the uh, Truman uh, was involved in, uh, in that kind of uh, deliberate uh, destructiveness over there. And uh, I, my question to you, Jeff, is uh, who else signed on to that? Was, that, was it just uh, Truman himself, or was that the members of Congress and the Senate Majority Leader and a whole bunch of other people? Because it... Uh, it really is unfortunate. And my other question is, why isn't this on? Uh, why isn't this stuff being uh, pr presented on PBS? I mean, Ken Burns and that gang over there, PBS is always glorifying the presidency, Roosevelt, Truman, LBJ. Why aren't they presenting this information, which is really fascinating and intriguing about what kind of scoundrels uh, uh, and the scoundrels and the secrets they keep? Thank you. Well, I'm going to answer your second question first. Uh, I do know Ken Burns came out with a series called The War. I've only watched a few episodes of it. I do not know how he handled this, so maybe he's already addressed that. Uh, why isn't more mainstream media uh, bringing this out? I think part of it is because... Uh, I'm going to try to choose my words carefully because having been a journalist for many, many years, but I'll tell you, when it comes to a lot of... The people that you see in mainstream media, they're journalists. And, and, and I say they're journalists in light of the fact that a lot of them don't study. They ask a subject matter expert and 
they bring that up on the screen and then they go on to the next story, ask a subject matter expert. Um, my producer says they're getting lazy as well, and you know, there's probably a certain amount of truth to that. I've, in my Air Force days, there were many times that we've had journalists from some local 4, 5, 9, 11 stations uh, that had come out and they bring a different reporter out every single time and we would give them very basic information about you know the C-130 aircraft. We would give them basic information uh, even about our unit name, the 934th Air Lift Wing. And they still got it wrong. And so we don't really, in today's era of journalism, we don't really get in depth into stories. Everything is pretty much on the, on the top, staying superficial. You know, back in the 60s, 70s, even the early 80s, I think we had a lot of really good in-depth reporters. But as they're just cranking out journalists through the diploma mills of our major universities these days, I don't think that the work ethic, and part of it may be the schooling, part of it is, is probably the way things are done with the assignment editors. You know, I do know a lot of great journalists out there, a lot of great people, but when, when you look at it, when you've got four or five stories that you have to do every single day and you're running all around a certain geographical area and all people want the 30 second sound bite, they don't want depth, everything stays on the surface. So some of that, I mean, I have to blame on the journalists, some of that I also have to blame on society at large. Covering something like Hiroshima in depth, it's a person like me who actually goes through and reads the documents and really hits the depth, becomes that subject matter expert, and it just happens to be I'm on TV telling you about it. But a lot of the other people who are, um, you know, working for the bigger studios, they don't have time. They don't have time for this kind of research. They don't have time to dig, dig deep. You know, they get into the, into the office, they get a phone call, or they see their assignment editor. Assignment editor says, go here. As soon as they get there, do something, the assignment editor calls and says, now go over here, bring this back to the studio. And these guys are on the run constantly. So the whole world has changed in the world of journalism in presenting information. And a lot of times that the journalists just don't have enough time to really assess and absorb a lot of that information. I remember when I was a young journalist that, I mean, I just happened to be one who takes in information like a sponge. I, I don't forget a lot of things. And, you know, I've learned a lot of stuff in the 13, 14 years I was an Air Force journalist. I learned a lot about the inner workings of the different offices in an Air Force unit. And that's just because I would keep writing the stories and writing the stories. And my retention would be greater, probably greater than most. And we don't necessarily have that in commercial journalism. And that's just the way it is. Uh, and that's probably neither a good thing nor a bad thing. As far as members of Congress signing off on it, that's the one thing I haven't even looked at. I don't know who signed off on it. Uh, as, the, as Truman being the commander in chief, I do know that at that point in time he had great latitude to make those kinds of decisions. So whether or not uh, members of Congress got signed off or not, I don't know. And thank you for asking that question because now that's something I'm actually uh, interested in and I'll have to take a look and see if I can find that answer. But in the meantime, that's our show for this week. So thank you very much for watching North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We'll see you next week. Go to www.youtube.com, North Star Oasis. <laughs>